In this video, I'll talk through what you can expect from the scientific computing course. First thing to ask is, what is scientific computing? Isn't it all just computing done by people who aren't good enough computer scientists? It's not, and let me offer an analogy. Here's a quote from the Hungarian mathematicians Erdos and Renyi. They're famous for figuring out pretty much everything there is to be figured out about random graphs. They said, a mathematician is a device for turning coffee into theorems. That's sort of true, although apparently all of Adosha's great theorems owe as much to amphetamines as to coffee, but that's another matter. Anyway, so you have the mathematician, she drinks the coffee, out come the theorems, and out comes something else, the inevitable byproduct of coffee. Okay, let's extend the analogy. Here's a picture of a software engineer, someone who can turn requirements into code. And what's the byproduct here? I think it's thought. Computer scientists have this mindset that it's code that's privileged. We're used to thinking of repositories and source files and compilation and so on, as if the lines of the code that we're churning out are the thing that matters. And that's true for a lot of professional software engineering. You come, you work on a project, you leave behind a code base, and that's your legacy. All the ideas you have along the way, they fade away like mist. Hopefully you learn something and it makes you a better person, but that learning isn't actually captured anywhere. So this is what's different about scientific computing. For scientific purposes, for data science and for investigative machine learning, it's your code that's flushed down the toilet and it's your ideas that are your legacy. And so this demands a totally different attitude to writing code. So what does this mean in practice for how we actually do scientific computing? Well, it means this, it means Jupyter Notebooks. Typically, it means programming in Python, and typically it uses some cornerstone libraries. And it means writing text and drawing plots. And this is what it tends to lead to. Complete, unmaintainable nightmare code where no one can figure out what it does, not even you a week later. So, what's good scientific code? Here's what you've been taught about good programming style in your OOP class. There's lots of great advice here about how to produce wonderful immaculate structured code bases full of best software engineering practice. I want you to ignore it. All of this is bad advice for scientific computing because it fetishizes the code over the ideas. Now, I think you'll get better advice about scientific code practices from another source. This is Marie Kondo, and this is what she'd have to say about code. Look at each line of your code and ask yourself, does it spark joy? If not, delete it. This is what scientific computing style is. It's all about how well you can go through your code and throw away all the clutter that accumulates. Clutter does accumulate, that's what life is. Scientific computing is all about exploring and trying things out, looking at the output, tweaking your ideas and your code and iterating, iterating, iterating. This is what your notebooks look like when you're in the creative flurry of experimentation. And this is what your notebooks had better look like at the end. You should accumulate code during a work session, but trim it at the end of each session to consolidate all the ideas you've learned. Your readers should be able to understand your work by reading top to bottom, and your code should all work if run top to bottom. I'm not saying this because you're going to be graded on the cleanliness of your code. No, not at all. The grading for this course will be based exclusively on your answers. No, I'm saying this from experience of seeing students who set traps for themselves by the way they structure their thoughts. And of course, from my own bitter experience of setting traps for myself, doing something and coming back to it a month later to write up and having no clue what it is that I did. Scientific computing code is not like other code. It's not a log file. Don't use it as a dump of everything you did. It should be more like a write-up, or at least that's what it should head towards. That's why Jupiter is such a slippery slope. There are no handrails in it to separate the exploratory sandbox phase from the write-up phase. And I think that there shouldn't be handrails because they just constrain your explorations, your investigations, and it's there that the creative stuff happens. But still, you want your explorations to count for something afterwards, and for that, you have to have the discipline. But it's also not a source file. 
There are plenty of people, computer scientists and software engineers, who say that all this Jupyter Notebook stuff is stupid and lightweight, done by people who aren't clever enough to code properly, coding properly with Java compilers, build processes, continuous integration, and all that stuff. That's fine if you're writing software to run a bank or an airplane, but it gets in the way if what you're trying to do is explore a dataset. It's not your code that matters in the end, it's your insights, it's the text cells in your notebook and the plots that carry your argument. Text cells are more important than code cells. Remember, code is the toilet of scientific computing. So I've been banging on about all this exploration and investigation and writing up. Let me say a bit more about this process. When you're exploring a data set or trying out a machine learning idea or testing a simulator, you have a head full of hypotheses that you want to try out. So programming languages for scientific computing are all about getting from ideas to output with as little in the way as possible. There's no point worrying about maintainability because chances are your hypotheses won't work out and you'll delete that code and try something else. What you need is a programming environment that lets you build up deep, intricate ideas as quickly as possible with a minimum of typing. So scientific computing code ends up being all about using rich, expressive libraries, libraries that let you do an awful lot with just a few lines of code. And this generally means libraries where there's a lot to learn about how they work and libraries where the code you do write is mostly just massaging your data so you can feed it into or out of those libraries. And that's what this course is actually designed to teach you about. All the lessons about how to structure your notebooks and so on, I'm hoping you'll pick up yourself from the general atmosphere of working on these. The nitty gritty of the libraries that everyone uses for data science and machine learning, that's the concrete thing that this course aims to teach and to test. Here's what the course actually consists of. The first section is a very rapid run through of Python. You're all computer scientists and you all know how to code and Python is one of the easiest languages to pick up. So I suggest you just skim through this section of the course and pay attention to just a couple of Python idioms that I'll draw your attention to in the notes. Parts two, three, and four are about three of the cornerstone libraries, NumPy for number crunching, Pandas for handling datasets, and matplotlib for plotting graphs. Please don't come out of this course and go back to plotting graphs in Excel. It'll make all the lecturers in the department cry. I've also thrown in an appendix with some recipes for data science. If you want to go and do your own scientific computing work, like pulling out data sets to do with COVID or Brexit and analyzing them, these recipes might be handy. Now about assessment. First, there is no exam there are only ticks. There are two ticks, each worth two marks, so you can get a total of four marks. Nearly everyone gets all four marks. These are ticks, they're not meant to be great big challenges. I mean for this course to take about 15 hours of study time in total. If my estimate is way off, please let me know. These four marks will be worth 7.7% .7 of the total grade on your maths paper. The ticks have online automated assessment. You have to pass the autograder and submit your notebooks by the 2nd of February, and then a random subset of you will have live ticks. In the past, everyone came to the Intel lab and got ticked, but right now with COVID, the department's policy is to cut down on ticking sessions. You can read up instructions for the autograder online on the course website, and I think it should all be fairly clear. But I do want to make one point about the autograder. Here's something I've heard from students in the past. My code passed test two, so I thought it was right, but in fact my code was buggy, and so it took me ages to debug and pass test three. Your grader sucks, they tell me. That's a basic misconception about what the autograder is for. It's not there to help you get your code right, it's there to test you. It's your job to write your own unit tests. Nature, when she gives you data sets, is full of guile and deceit, and as a data scientist, you need to always be vigilant and always test your assumptions. That's your job. It's not the job of the autograder. Okay, on to some practicalities. You can do your work wherever you like. All you need is Jupyter and Python 3. In fact, you don't even need Jupyter. You can do it all with VS Code and old school plain text source files if you prefer. 
Hub.cl is great because it's there and it works. Uh, personally, though, I'm always happier using my own machine because I never know when an online service will go down and eat all my files. If you want to use your own machine, there are plenty of instructions out there for setting up Python and Jupyter. There aren't any notebook templates or anything for this course. You just create your own notebooks from scratch. One of the goals for this course is to get you used to the discipline of structuring your ideas into notebooks. So that's why I'm leaving it to you. The course material is all up now and the two ticks will be released over the next two weeks. I'll send out announcements via Moodle. Finally, help and support. You're meant to do this work on your own over the Christmas holiday. The idea is that if your younger brother or sister is bugging you, or if you're being given all the washing up to do, you can escape by saying, I have important coursework to do. Anyway, everyone will work at different times, so there aren't any scheduled live help sessions over the vacation, so please ask questions on the Moodle forum. Then, at the beginning of the term, the deadline is two weeks after the start of full term, so there will be time to get live help. Your director of studies should have lined up one supervision early in Lent term. There won't be any exercises for you to do for the supervision, it's just there for you to discuss your code with your supervisor. I'll give the supervisor some suggestions about what they might usefully discuss with you. Please don't treat it as a chore, treat this as a chance to get feedback on your code. That's what's so great about the Cambridge system that you don't get anywhere else apart from Oxford. It's the supervision system and it's there for you. Also, I'll offer some Zoom sessions for live help early in that term. Um, email me or ask questions on Moodle so I know what sort of demand to expect. Okay, that's all. I hope you enjoyed the course. Best wishes and happy Christmas.